So what I'd like to do now is talk about the five fundamental changes that have occurred to building performance in the last 50 years. The five fundamental changes are increased thermal resistance, the changing of the permeability of the linings that we put on the inside and outside of the building enclosure, the water and mold sensitivity of our building materials has been going up, the ability for the building enclosure to store and redistribute moisture is going down, and we now have complex three-dimensional airflow networks that inadvertently couple the building enclosure to the breathing zone of the occupied space. Fundamental change number one is reducing the drying potential by adding thermal resistance. We humidified our older buildings because they had such huge drying potentials because they had huge energy exchange. It was unbelievable. Repeated wetting followed by repeated drying was never a problem. Got wet, dried, wet, dried. What made it all work was massive energy exchange. We're going to dramatically increase the amount of thermal resistance in our building enclosures, not just roofs, walls, but foundations and slabs everywhere in the United States. And the consequences of that are going to be a huge reduction in drying potential. Now, the answer is not to not insulate the building enclosure. That's not the answer. The answer is to compensate for that with better materials, clever design, understand the physics, and deal with it. Fundamental change number two is the permeability of the enclosure linings that we put on the inside and outside. We have a huge reduction in water vapor transmission to the inside by going to plastic vapor barriers, vinyl wallpaper, and foil-faced fiberglass bats. That's just not sustainable. On the outside, we've gone from plywood to OSB. OSB doesn't breathe. We've gone to insulating sheathings made out of plastic, foil-faced, that also don't breathe. So we basically have a lining on the outside that doesn't breathe and a lining on the inside that doesn't breathe. We fill the space between the two with a lot of thermal resistance and then install a water injection system called a window. You can't put a vapor barrier on both sides of the assembly. We're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to make design decisions depending on where you are to put one on the outside or on the inside, but you shouldn't have one on both sides. You can design around this. We just haven't taken advantage of that. We've not elected to control the permeability of the linings. In fact, in many cases, we've put up regulatory impediments in giving us the ability and the flexibility to control the permeability of the linings on both the inside and the outside of the building enclosure. Change number three, the water and mold sensitivity of our building materials is increasing. Here's where I'd like to sort of take a small digression and tell you about mold. Mold is a water problem. No water, no mold. Repeat after me. No water, no mold. We have more mold, but we don't have more water. The water we've always had is hanging around longer in building materials that can't tolerate it. When the rate of wetting is greater than the rate of drying, we have accumulation. When the quantity of accumulated moisture exceeds the moisture storage capacity of the material system or assembly, we have a problem. And that storage capacity is time, temperature, and material specific. So mold on framing material is just a surface phenomena. Just wipe it off with soap and water and be done. It's always been like that. Those people that run around with the ET suits and the HEPA vacuums and the negative pressure containment, that's just a tax on stupid people. The trouble is, is that we don't build much out of board lumber. So of cutting the tree into boards, what do we do? We peel the tree. We peel it. We take those layers and we smoosh them together under heat and pressure. We cook the raw wood meat to tenderize it. We make plywood. And the plywood comes out to the job site slightly brownish in color because we've caramelized the wood sugars. We're making mold candy. So you're mold and you got a choice between OSB and plywood. What are you going to choose? OSB. OSB, plywood, plywood, lumber, lumber, tree. 
Are we done? No. Take those fibers, grind them down into sawdust. We have a big pile of sawdust. We have to stick the sawdust together. We need nitrogen for a fixation reaction. Where are we going to get a limitless source of nitrogen? Well, the back end of a cow. So we take urea, urine, cow piss. So sawdust and cow piss mixed all up together, and we make particle board. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you ever smell particle board when it's wet, Lisa? What does it smell like? Cow piss, because what's in it? Cow piss. Particle board, hard board, hard board, OSB, OSB, plywood, plywood, lumber, lumber tree. Old mold with no teeth can eat paper. <laughs> what do we do with this paper? Well, we laminate it to both sides of gypsum board. We have paper faced gypsum board. Drywall. And what do we do? We color the paper green like we're going to fool the mold. <laughs> and where do we put the green board? In a wet area, in a shower. As we move down the process stream from timber to engineered materials, each step of the way, the processing makes the products more water and mold sensitive. I remember, using, I remember framing subfloors with 2 by 10s and plywood over a crawl space. Now I use an eye joist and OSB. Which one gets mold faster? The eye joist and the OSB. Same exposure, same everything, only thing that changes is the material, and I have a huge increase in water and mold sensitivity. All right, let's look at change number four, the hygric buffer capacity of the building enclosure. A 1950 house had a hygric buffer capacity of around 50 gallons. That meant it could take 50 gallons worth of leaking windows, missing flashing, plumbing, condensation, snow, rain, stupid stuff, and the building would give the world the New Jersey salute. Eh, I don't care. How much water can a steel stud hold? Zero. Zero. And let's replace the plywood sheathing with gypsum sheathing. So we've gone from a hygric buffer capacity of 50 gallons to 3 gallons. Which wall systems are going to require perfect windows, perfect doors, perfect flashing, and perfect maintenance forever? The steel studs and the gypsum. Do you realize in the last century the hygric buffer capacity <laughs> of the typical building in North America has decreased two orders of magnitude and that's why we have a mold problem. Those older buildings were like boxers in the 50s that could take a punch, a moisture hit, a moisture event and shake it off. While a modern building is like a building with a glass jaw where a single moisture event puts the building down. I've now have coupled this hollow three-dimensional network via the mechanical system to the breathing zone of the occupied space. In the last 50 years, what my generation of engineers and architects and contractors has managed to do is we've managed to turn the building enclosure into the contaminant and we've turned the mechanical system into the contaminant interstate that couples the enclosure to the breathing zone of the occupied space. And we have to come to terms with that. The five fundamental changes are increased thermal resistance, the changing of the permeability of the linings that we put on the inside and outside of the building enclosure, the water and mold sensitivity of our building materials has been going up. The ability for the building enclosure to store and redistribute moisture is going down. And we now have complex three-dimensional airflow networks that inadvertently couple the building enclosure to the breathing zone of the occupied space.